My name is Adam Roberts, and I'm a vocal coach here in the live music capital of the world, Austin, Texas. I'm on a journey to learn the stories behind extraordinary voices of people I know and what makes them unique. Each of my guests has chosen to follow their voice. So this is Cola Voce. So I am thrilled to be here with Amado de Hoyos who is a new friend, a relatively new friend. I guess we've known each other for about four months or so now. And I first met Amado when he took a music theory course from me. And he's now uh, enrolled in a conservatory program that I teach as part of and is in my uh, voice and movement class at the moment. So welcome, Amado. It is great to have you here today. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well. One of the things that I'm hoping that we are able to do on this podcast is to talk to people who come from very different backgrounds as they approach the voice. And most of the people that I'm planning to talk to are people who have very different reasons for exploring their voice in a new way. And Amado, I know for you, that very much comes down to acting primarily, right? Indeed, yes. Even though we are doing some singing work, if it's begrudgingly. (laughs) We're doing some singing work. Uh, (laughs) Terrifying. But one of the other things that I'm hoping to do on this podcast is to bring to light some uh, vocal techniques uh, for listeners, if you will. I assume that a lot of the people listening to this podcast may be people who have a vested interest in the voice and, and vocal technique. And one of the analogies that I use a lot when I'm coaching, whether it is coaching the speaking voice or coaching the singing voice revolves around analogies of flight, because I think that there are so many ways to conceive of the voice uh, almost as phases of flight. And I, you know, I guess I'm talking about sort of commercial airline flight, but one of the uh, things I thought would be really cool to talk with you about today as a former rocket scientist, is to unpack a little bit about um, what some of the more specific ways of talking about this might be. And I'm wondering if you can take us back to your, um, you know, early days of thinking about rocket science as a career. Tell us a little bit about your education and then, you know, what your work involved. Okay. Um, When I left high school, you know how when everybody's young and growing up, they have their dreams of what they want to be. And that's usually, oh, I want to be a fireman or I want to be a policeman or I want to be a princess. Mine was, um, I wanted to be either an actor or an astronaut. And at the time, um, I decided uh, it would probably be easier to make a career um, chasing the astronaut dream. So I went to an engineering school. I went to MIT. Um, and studied there and got an that aeronautical. That little engineering school, MIT. A little tiny one. You might have heard of it. You know, the, the Goodwill hunting thing. Um, <laughs> and so I got a, a degree in uh, uh, aeronautical and astronautical engineering. Um, and uh, that was my undergrad. I went to Purdue for graduate school. And I was uh, working in a lab there. And, and I had an internship during the summers. And I was working at a lab in NASA. And the person that I worked for at NASA... He decided to leave NASA and work at SpaceX. And um, so he kind of knew what I was able to do and said, you know what, maybe it's not. I was planning to to try and get a PhD. And he uh, basically called up and said, you know, it's not a good time for funding right now and what you're trying to do. Why don't you take a little break? Come work at SpaceX for a little while. And then you can go back to, you know, graduate school or your PhD or whatever else is next. Um a little bit later. And so that's what I did. I uh, finished up my master's degree and went down and worked for SpaceX. And what was supposed to be a year or two ended up turning into eight years. Amazing. Now I want to back up for a second. I have a a good friend and a former student who, this is interesting, he actually was, you know, when he left high school and really in college, he found himself in the same situation. So He went to um, UT for music education, got his bachelor's degree in music education, and through the intervening couple of years, really pursued acting and did some really great stage work. Um, After he did that, he decided that he would go back to school to complete um, an undergraduate degree in aerospace engineering. He now works for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at NASA. And so it's interesting how he sort of had this 
also this dichotomy of astronaut because becoming an astronaut was also his goal when he started out in aerospace engineering. And so I've learned so many things that I never knew about aeronautics and um, and just the way that becoming an astronaut works, because I think a lot of people don't really realize, I know I certainly didn't, that oftentimes astronauts are people who are going into space to conduct research on behalf of other scholars, right? It's a very correct? big thing. Yeah, that's in fact, a lot of what happens on the International Space Station is that they send up uh, basically science experiments. And the astronauts up there are the people that run these experiments. So they go from one little box to another and, you know, tweak this knob and change this and do that and record these results. So they're working on behalf of researchers here on Earth. Which is really interesting because I think that like there's this mythos around it. It's kind of like being a conductor. Sometimes people are like, what do you do as a They always ask me, what do you do when you're conducting? Like, what is your purpose? What do you do? But you just people, wave the magic wand, right? You just wave the, wave the magic wand. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, kind of. Um, but people see you doing it. And a lot of people are like, oh, I want to be a conductor. But they don't really know anything that it actually entails. And I think like astronaut work is similar in a way. You're just kind of like, well, we know they wear these spacesuits and they go to the space station or they land on the moon, you know, but we don't know what they actually do when they're there. The, the purpose of sort of, and I know there are many purposes. It's not just science. It can be exploration and not just necessarily only the field that goes up and, and sort of does scientific experiments. But I want to back up for a second and ask you, you mentioned that you did your undergraduate degree in, um, you said aerospace engineering and aeronautical engineering. Is that right? It was, it's uh, all together. It's one, it's called aeronautical and astronautical engineering. Okay. So we did half of it was planes and the other half was rockets. So that's the difference. That's what I was going to ask you. So what is the difference between, I assume astronautical would be the rocket side. Yes. And aeronautical is the plane side. Yes. Interesting. So what is the difference then between, say, for example, and I know schools are different, obviously, in programs, but what is the difference between my friend who did his aerospace engineering degree, for example, versus a program that does aeronautical and astronautical? It's probably exactly the same. Just mine has a few more letters. Interesting. Okay. So it's exactly the same yeah. thing. It's just like literally what you're looking at. Because you know, he, I know it's another parallel between you two. He's about to do his flight instrument check test flight um, in the next, I think, couple of weeks. Ooh. And I know that you are working on a private pilot's license right now too, correct? I am learning to fly a plane, yes. Amazing. So he's doing the exact same thing. And it's interesting because when he was in school, I don't, I mean, not like we just talked to aerospace all day, but I don't remember him ever talking about anything to do with planes. I only really remember him talking about the things that were sort of space related and not necessarily because space is cooler that's why is it it's uh, oh, but yeah. what about oh, flying yeah. a plane flying a plane's fun but for me flying a plane is is it's a it's an opportunity to get to from point a to point b um it's kind of like driving a car but more scenic and space would just way top shelf so you go to undergrad, you get your undergrad degree. Did you know mm -hmm. that you wanted to, I mean, was your trajectory, is it the trajectory to do what you wanted to do is basically to go right on, right? To go to grad school. Yeah, I think so. Yes. That's the thing most people do. Um, I mean, th there's no set path for, you know, become an astronaut. If you look at the, the NASA astronaut selection, they take people from everywhere. So there's doctors, there's physicists, there's chemists, there's... Um, people that went through through the military and, and were flying jets. So it, it's really kind of what they're looking for at the time and the person that has the right combination of, of uh, qualifications. Interesting. And so that one just seemed like one that made sense for me. How did you choose Purdue as your graduate school institution? Um, Purdue is actually a very good school for, for astronautics. They have a very good rocket laboratory there. Oh, um, so that's one of the things that I was looking at. And for me, in, in particular, I was doing um, what's called electric propulsion. So when we think of, you know, when we think of rockets, we think of, you know, the, the big earth rumbling fire and all of that. Sure. But when you get to in space, there's some uh, nifty things you can do um, with electromagnets um, to use propellant very, very efficiently. And that's starting to come into its own. And Purdue is actually building a lab. So for me, it was the opportunity to go and explore with that, to, to build my own lab. And so there you met 
you sort of networked and thus got your position at SpaceX through doing that internship. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And so you go to SpaceX, which is in Houston, correct? No, no. Uh, SpaceX is in, well, SpaceX is headquartered in uh, Los Angeles, like okay. the heart of the aerospace world. I see. But uh, we have, we had a testing facility here in Texas. So near Waco. So that's where okay. I ended up back again. I see. Ah, oh, interesting. Okay. So you go to work for SpaceX and what does your job there entail? So I was a test engineer, um, was, was my job, overall job title. Um, and what that entailed um, over time was, was basically administering tests. Um, so uh, On rockets? On rockets? Yeah, rocket tests. Uh, and I was there during a time of heavy development. So this is when SpaceX was developing the, the engines that are the workforce of the SpaceX vehicles right now. Um, well, let me let me stop you there for a second okay. just to ask, because I have this question myself. I've heard of SpaceX a lot from my other friend, um, but what what does SpaceX do? Because I never really got the, I never from him got the complete picture of the difference between like a NASA, mm, not mission as in mission, but like a NASA's sort of um, menu of interests um, which I'm sure change a lot, but versus like a SpaceX or versus, uh, I think there was one called T something that he would tell me about. Maybe not. Um, but I'm curious to know um, what is the purview of, of SpaceX as a company? So SpaceX is a launch service provider. If we, if we back, back, uh, back up like 50 years, right, when, when NASA was going to the moon, NASA did everything. They built the rockets, they built the landers, they built the satellites, they did it all from end to end. So that's kind of what's been happening for the last 50 years. These companies that, that NASA was working with to get all of that done, they've held on to those businesses. Um, so your, your Boeing and your uh, Lockheed Martin and the, the companies that have spun out from those. So SpaceX looked at it and said, you know what, we can do the launch part of that cheaper. There's fun, interesting stories about, you know, Elon Musk, what he wanted to do was um, he made uh, millions of dollars with PayPal. Um, and then decided he wanted to put a greenhouse on, on Mars to show that it could be done. And he had gone to Russia to, to basically buy an old ICBM so that he could launch this greenhouse to Mars. And Which ICBM the, is? Oh, sorry. An, an intercontinental ballistic missile. It's a rocket. Got it. But, yeah. you know, when they used to be used for, you know, war purposes, and now it's the same thing. You can be used to launch satellites or whatever you hmm. want. So he went to Russia with a big suitcase of money, and they told him, you know, all right, price double. And he said, that's ridiculous. And so he took his briefcase of money back to the United States and decided he could do it on his own for cheaper. And so he hired the people to um, help him achieve that dream. Um, and so SpaceX came out of that. Um, and so his dream is still to go to Mars, to take people to Mars. Um, and what he's doing in the interim is, is basically building the systems that allow him to do that. So by building rockets, he can launch satellites for providers, you know, whether it's uh, the U.S. government or small companies that are trying to provide internet service or television service or whatever, whatever you want a satellite to do, SpaceX will get your package, your satellite from point A on Earth to point B in orbit. Interesting. It's almost in a in a sense, it's almost like a not a third part. What is a third party? Yeah, it is. But it's almost like a middle. <laughs> it's they, you know, it's 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 a it's part of the supply chain in a way. It's part of the yeah, ab absolutely. And then so that's what that's what it's allowed NASA to do now is NASA can focus on the scientific missions, right? You know, we just had a land uh, a lander. Your friend from JPL probably had a big hand in it. Um, but they landed the Perseverance rover on Mars uh, a few days ago. So that's a huge thing. And there, you know, it's going to explore the explore the surface and try and find evidence of water and life and all of these other things. So NASA can concentrate on that, on the science, um, and leave the, the launch to other smaller companies. Like Interesting. So, so I, then SpaceX is really working sort of alongside, I would imagine, like NASA engineers throughout the process in terms of, because I mean, is there, is there a collaboration there about the way in which the design of the rocket needs to launch? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and especially um, one of the things that SpaceX is doing um, and and did recently last year was uh, launch astronauts to the space station. When the space shuttle retired, there were, you know, there was issues with the space shuttle. It maybe wasn't the safest. And so they decided to retire it, um, which left the United States entirely dependent on Russia to be able to get astronauts to and from the, the International Space Station. Um and so uh, they had been looking at a way to to bring some of that uh, technology back home to the United States. And so what NASA did was they basically put out a set of requirements, said, here's what we need to do. We need to be able to get astronauts safely from, from Earth to the space station and um, had sort of a, co- a competition type deal. Um, and SpaceX and Boeing were kind of co-recipients of that award. And and have been developing kind of on parallel paths this capability to get uh, uh, astronauts from U.S. soil back to the space station. Um, and so SpaceX did that. Um, and they had, again, you get a list of requirements. The flight profile has to look like this. And we have to match up for this for safety. And SpaceX designed a system around that. Interesting. I think that, you know, this is all very as you just said, kind of newsworthy and topical right now because of the landing of Perseverance. and um, Very big deal. And also um, with Elon Musk relocating Tesla to Austin, because we're, you know, we're in Austin here. Well, you're in Waco, which for people who are unfamiliar, it's about an hour and a half north of Austin driving straight shot north. Um, but uh, it's interesting that all of these things are kind of the confluence of all these things happening at once. I have a question for you, which is, um, before we get back to your journey at at SpaceX, it's a little diversion, but, you know, one of the things that I think my friend has been involved with at some point in NASA is looking at possible colonization opportunities on other planets, um, which planets might have atmospheres and conditions that could potentially house human life um, at some point. And I'm interested to know um, from you, what is the significance? I mean, it's obviously, it's like super cool that this Perseverance mission has now successfully completed. It went through its seven minutes of craziness to go through the atmosphere and land. Um, I think I read, right, that it takes 15 minutes to send a signal back to Earth. I think it's 11, but yeah, it's, it's up there. Yeah. So what is what is the significance of this event? Um one it's it's another it's another big milestone for us. Um landing on Mars is incredibly different difficult. Uh I think something like half of the uh the probes that we've sent to the planet didn't make it. Mm. Um so it's it's very difficult and and part of that difficulty is again there's that 11 minute um d- delay between when a signal is sent and when it reaches the earth and likewise when it's sent from the earth and when it reaches Mars. And so you you kind of have to do all of these things in the dark. So the satellite really has to have the satellite and the probe and the landers and all of those. They've got to be these self-contained packages. And there's a lot that can go wrong. Rockets are very, very difficult. And and landing is one of the hardest parts of that. Um, it It's slowing down from these incredible – it has to slow down from these incredible speeds as it enters the atmosphere and then, you know, land very precisely on this planet that's uh, – farther away from the earth than the sun i think or something well yeah like i was gonna say the lot didn't it launch back in like july and it's now february right yeah it took like six months i think it's normally something like eight yeah so or eight months yeah for it to get to to mars that's amazing so this so th- all of this right now it, it's it's a learning experience right you know um if hopefully everything goes right and then you know you have this in your tool bag, and you can use that for for later on. But the other part of it is um, all of these probes that we're sending up, they're looking for any signs of uh, you know what is there on Mars? Is there water? What does the atmosphere look like? What do storms look like on a daily basis? What are the hazards that we're going to encounter as we start to send to try to send humans there? So take us back, if you would, to SpaceX. It sounds like. You know, you have, I mean, you went to MIT, you went to Purdue, where they're building this new lab, you get this position at SpaceX. It sounds like, you know, from an outsider's perspective, you're like living it. You're living the life. You're, you know, you're doing amazing things. You're, was, I mean, was it what you, but, but you're not a, you're not an astronaut. What, what was that? 
It was. No, for me, it was incredibly fun. I loved every minute of it. Um, and the, the payoff for us always was, you know, we had very long days sometimes. Um, it was early in, in the, the development of the SpaceX systems. So things didn't always go right. Um, and we had to find all of those problems and fix all of those problems, which sometimes is not so much fun. It ends in big fireball type problems. But uh, the payoff at the end of the day was usually we ended up with a rocket test. So um, we're in a bunker a quarter mile away from, from where the, 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 the engine is. And uh, we turn it on, we're monitoring systems, and the ground is literally shaking around you, rumbling around you. So there is nothing like that feeling um, of, of being that near a rocket engine. And how uh, many years were you there? So I was there for eight years. Eight years. Eight years. Okay. So really, in your aerospace career, you worked exclusively for SpaceX. Is that right? Yeah, for the most part. Yeah. I mean, again, I had internships, at, but the big part of it, the actual work was SpaceX. Amazing. So what then, let's transition to the second part of what we're talking about and with regard to the voice. What then says to you, it's time to make a big transition. Um, for me, it was, I guess, when I started at SpaceX, and, and particularly in Texas, uh, there were 10 people working at the Texas facility. I think I was around number 400 in SpaceX overall. So it was this very small and close-knit family. And so, you know, as the years went on, it grew and grew and grew. When I left uh, SpaceX Texas, I think there were close to 500 people working there. So it just it didn't have the same small family feel that it that it had when I started, and it was a difficult transition for me um, to get you know from the the way that a small company can work and operate to a way a larger company has to work and operate. Um, and so I you know at some point I just decided let's go see what else is on my journey. So I left. Um, my plan was to do a little little bit of traveling and see some of the the highlights of the world. And then have a, a, a go at acting. Um, and that little bit of traveling turned into a five-year stint on the road. Which is amazing here I am. because when you look at your social, like your photographs of every place you've been are incredible. I mean, it's, it's you, you have seen so many places and experienced so much. It's really quite amazing. It still blows my mind. It's, it's unreal. Um, and, and hopefully... Everybody gets that opportunity uh, to travel. Um, I mean, even within just the United States, we have so many wonders here. But yeah, the rest of the world is chock full of incredible. Well, and what I think is so cool if you go to your social is that you you don't simply post photos. You really give a rundown that includes some history, that includes some of what it was like to be there, that includes a lot of almost kind of a little bit of a anthropology in a fun way. And it allows people to really get that glimpse um, into what you were experiencing through a very personal lens so that it's, you know, not necessarily, I mean, obviously National Geographic is great, and but you're getting a really personal take at experiencing these things from someone who's very passionate. When, when I started traveling, I recognized that the opportunities that I had um, at that point in my life were, were something that the, the people that I was closest to, my family and friends, might never have the opportunity to, uh, to do, whether because they didn't have the money or because you know they had families and you can't just pick up and go to China for a month if you have uh, that, that sort of commitment. So because I had that opportunity, I wanted to be able to share it as much as I possibly could. So I, I spend a lot of time um, in, in those posts, trying to, to present the world um, at its best in the hopes that, you know, for some people, maybe they won't never have the opportunity uh, t to make that trip. Um, at least they'll be able to see it. And for others, maybe it'll inspire them to, you know, to go visit this thing they'd never heard of. Yeah, no, absolutely. So you were, for all intents and purposes, on the road for five years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. So my last question in sort of like that time frame of your life is how did you reconcile with not, um, you know, pursuing the astronaut route after you had done that work? What made you say, I want to go and do these other things as opposed to continue toward the astronaut path? Um, again, it's the, the astronaut 
quote unquote path is it, it can be anything again, because they're looking for a little bit of anything and everything. So theoretically, I'm still on that path. Um, when I left SpaceX, NASA had opened up applications for astronauts at that point. And so I put in my, uh, my application. Um, I didn't hear back, which is kind of a shame, but you know, um, and last year they had another, um, opening for applications. So my application is there, you know, it's kind of an, mine, mine is an interesting journey because I did have this eight years of, of engineering, um, experience with Mm -hmm. rockets. And then it's easy and hard to explain the last five years. Um, and and basically trying to explain, you know, I wasn't on a beach for five years drinking umbrella drinks. I was out exploring and trying to share the world. And I think I would do a good job of exploring uh, and and sharing the solar system or the universe or so maybe NASA will see that and decide it's time, but I've not yet given up on that. Well, let's get into the, you know, performing side of things. You said that when you were younger, you even sort of in high school, you were saying I could pursue this acting side. I could pursue this um, aerospace side. And it sort of seems like the aerospace side is, is going to be more, practical and I love it too. So it makes it tips the scale, right? Um, What about acting back then inspired you to want to potentially pursue a career in it? I have, I've just always loved acting. Um, Aerospace was a passion for me. Trying to be an astronaut was a passion for me. But given the choice between the two, I would have pursued acting if I'd have known, you know, for a certainty that it would have been a successful endeavor for me. Um, so now, right now, this is the opportunity for me to, to pursue a dream. So that's kind of what I'm doing. And what are your hopes for your, um, do you have goals? Do you have dreams? Do you have, you know, a trajectory mapped out in your mind for yourself as an actor? Yes and no. Uh, it's, it, it's a, it's a tough one to plan for to, 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 to try and dream around, isn't it? Because there's so many tales of like, you know, people go and chase that dream and just kind of get battered against the rocks. So I haven't, I haven't set like super high goals or dreams. It's just, let's see where this takes me. Let's see where this journey goes. Um, and, and continue to do it for as long as it's fun. And and so for the last year, I've been taking classes uh, and it's continued to be fun. And and so even if it's just that, you know, performing individual scene works and exploring these different worlds right now, it's yeah. Well, you said something to me not long ago that I thought was really cool, which was that you pretty much have fun with whatever you're doing in the moment. Yeah, I like to think that, you know, anything that... It, when I was working at SpaceX, uh, I was testing rockets. That was the best thing in my life. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. When I was traveling, um, it was the best time of my life, and I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Now that I'm taking just just taking just taking the acting classes, is the best time of my life, and I couldn't imagine doing anything else. So I, I like to think that I bring that kind of positive mindset to anything that I do. That I'd be happy anywhere doing anything. So, it kind of leaves all doors open. Positive and also, I think, something that a lot of people really wish that they had. I mean, there, I, it, you know, the more that I've worked with individual people pursuing a career um, in, in the arts or in the um, entertainment or performance industries, the more you realize that truly there are as many people as you meet who say, I just could never imagine doing anything else. You also meet a lot of people that say, I'm just not sure what my passion is. And, you know, that brings along its own difficulties, of course, for, for someone. I'm not sure what it is that I want to do. There's a musical Pippin and, you know, the famous opening to Pippin is I got to find my corner of the sky, right? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I, I know there's some purpose for me and I need to find what it is. One of the, you know, the, I don't know if you saw it, but um, Disney, Disney released a movie called Soul. Mm-hmm. Did you see that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and, and the end part of that was basically like, the, the, the takeaway for me was that my purpose is just to be able to live and experience. That's what I enjoy the most. So anything that I do is in line with that. And, and one of the great things about acting has always been you get so many experiences so quickly because you're, you're going to live through the range of human experiences, the loss, the pain, the falling in love, all in the span of you know, a, a five minute scene or a two hour play or a 10 year series or any, whatever it is. 
Absolutely. So, Amado, we now have the segment of Colo Voce that is called Voice Memos. Are you ready? Uh Uh-oh. Okay. Wait. Okay, I'm ready. Voice Memos is a segment where I have come up with 10 questions just for you, and they're all about your favorite blank. So I'm going to ask you who or what is your favorite blank. There are 10 of them. You don't get... And they're not going to be multiple choice. They're not going to be multiple choice because I don't know your favorite everything. (sighs) So I'm going to ask you what your favorite blank is. No explanation. You just have to give whatever comes to the top of your head. Do I get a little bit of time to think about it? Well, this is a podcast, so you know what happens with dead air. (laughs) Dead air is not the best. Just edit it out. Well, that might happen anyway. Okay. (laughs) Are you ready for voice memos? I don't think so, but yeah, let's go. Some of these are going to be voice-related questions, but not all of them. Uh-oh. Some of them are going to be questions pertaining to the rest of what we've talked about. Uh-oh. Here we go. Amado, who is your favorite singer? I would have to go with uh, Whitney Houston. Ooh. Favorite yeah, astronaut. Amazing. Favorite astronaut. No explanation. Hey, hey, I, uh, I'm thinking. No explanation I'm necessary time. for I'm her. time. Favorite astronaut. Favorite astronaut. I actually have to go Soviet and go with Yuri Gagarin because he was first. Okay. Many explanations. No explanations. Many. Favorite album. Um, I'm an old alternative rock person, so uh, the, the original Third Eye Blind. Oh. I don't know what the album name is. You could have just stopped with old. Okay. Favorite <laughs> space mission. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the, the lunar landing. Um, yeah, what a leap that was. Obviously. Favorite movie soundtrack? The Greatest Showman. Mm, okay. By a mile. By a mile. Favorite musical group? Ooh. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to say The Beatles. Okay. Favorite speaker or thought leader? Uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Okay. Yeah. Favorite musical genre? Uh, again, I'm, I'm alternative rock, so yeah. Judge me. Oh, I do. I know you are. I know oh, I do. do. Your listeners, too. Favorite song about space? You know, it, it's a downer, but Major, ta- Major Tom. Major Tom. Uh, space, it's, well, it's called Space Oddity, but everybody knows. Oh, is that what that's called, that song? That little, <laughs> that little song? I'm just making sure. <laughs> And finally, number 10, your favorite podcast host. Ooh, wow. Oh, this is tough. I don't really listen to too many podcasts, so... So you can just go with me and we're good. That's great. Thanks so much. And that was Voice (laughs) Memos. Before we get back to our interview, a big shout out to Riley Wesson for editing this episode, Scott Ferguson for graphic design, and Jay Quinton Johnson for writing and performing the Voice Memos theme. Voice Memos. Now, I want to move on to talking a little bit about those two things put together. Okay. You know, as a vocal coach, whether I'm working with people who sing or whether I'm working with people who speak, probably more along the lines of people who are singing in a certain context, particularly because I work a lot with contemporary commercial vocalists and more specifically, a lot with musical theater performers. And so, you know, there is belting in musical theater. And in musical theater, a belt is something that perceptually as an audience member, you feel is this really powerful moment. And it can be really vocally powerful for sure. But, you know, in my mind, a lot of what the power comes from in a belt perceptually from an audience perspective has a lot to do with the whole performance in the moment. And not just the performance, but also the text and the music and what's happening but what, what ends up happening is a lot of people will put 
a lot of the onus of the energy of, of that belt moment on their voice. So instead of saying, I'm going to, and this is a skill that has to be learned, instead of learning how to, in a moment of, because, you know, belted moments typically happen in really big, you think defying gravity, really big cathartic moments in a song, uh, tomorrow, the sun will come out tomorrow, right? All of these famous belted moments uh, on my own, uh, you know, picking musicals that folks might be uh, more familiar with if they're not sort of in the musical theater. And so these moments often happen in, in these cathartic, big ways. And because of that, you know, actors are human too, and it's really easy to start pushing and to try to make these very chesty sounds in really loud ways and, and beyond not being that aesthetically great. Oftentimes, um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, it doesn't sound so good either. Well, you know, there's a colloquial term that we, that we use a lot, which is scrouting, um, which is screen belting. And that is something to be avoided. <laughs> we don't, we don't want to be scrouting, um, when we perform in a musical. Um, but a lot of people do it. And part of what, uh, you know, besides the aesthetic issue is that you can do damage to your vocal mechanism by not using great technique that results in a skrelt or that results in someone, um, you know, constantly over singing and trying to carry their chest voice up very high, which is required in musical theater. But you can do things to do that in a very healthy way if you're trained. And it's like kind of like going to the gym, too. You have to train the instrument as a physical reality, which is, which it is, you know, it's, it's, there are muscles and ligaments and all kinds of things going on there. Um, and also the coordination of how your breath works along with your larynx or your voice box and your resonators and all these things. But unfortunately, what ends up happening a lot is that you'll get a lot of over singing. And so people, um, you know, and a skrelt is an example of over singing, but you get all of these times when you know, a lot of people outside of the musical theater will say, I just don't really enjoy going to musicals because they scream all the time, right? Or they yell all the time. Um, <laughs> and you do, you hear that a lot and you do hear that a lot. <laughs> that's not, that's not necessarily like a, an invalid claim that gets made. So one of the things that we try to do as vocal coaches is help people to still achieve that moment of the belt, which is not only vocal. You know, we try to help the voice be one part of what that is. But actually, what's interesting about that is it requires a lot less effort than what people often put behind it. So people often will kind of do the rocket launch version of the belt, which is not necessarily what you want. People will put way too much um First of all, they might take way too much air and then try to sing on way too much air. They might really get in the moment and not be able to sort of flip that switch that they need to when they're so in it as an actor that they just then start sort of yell belting. Um, and so all of these things that have to come t together in order to help people belt healthily and belt eight times a week if you're in a Broadway show, for example. Um, you know, so there's a lot, a lot going on there. And so an analogy that I found to be super helpful when talking to people about this, and actually I wrote an article for Backstage Magazine where I talked about this in a very broad colloquial way. Um, we're using analogies of flight, uh, as I mentioned before, to sort of talk with people about how not to feel as though they need to put so much pressure behind the sound. And it's something that takes a little while typically for a person to feel um, and realize because it, it you know, typically the, the, the body does not um, acquiesce to this right away. And so, you know, you have to tell someone, be patient. It might take a month or a couple of months of doing this and practicing this before you can actually experience the sort of flight aspect of this. But I'll tell you sort of what I do when I explain this. And then I want to hear your, um, your much better <laughs> explanation of what's actually going on here as it, uh -oh. regards, as it regards flight. Now that I know that aeronautics is planes, this is great. Okay. <laughs> you know, most people um, in musical theater, um, I guess, you know, if they're pursuing it professionally, have been on at least one flight in their life. And I think about 
the fact that we have to, you know, um, accelerate to that takeoff. And at that point, we are using a lot of engine thrust, right? Um, okay. And I think that the thing that is is that I differentiate a lot between when I'm talking to people in this analogy is the difference between when we're really using a lot of thrust in the engines and when we're really throttling back on the engines and allowing aerodynamics to keep the plane going in a way that is not so powered by the engines. So in the way I understand it, you know, we need a lot of engine thrust for the um, takeoff aspect of flight. So we finally hit that place where the pilot rotates the plane, takes off from the runway. And it's interesting because, you know, in most takeoffs that I've been part of anyway, you get that sensation of the fuselage that sort of, um, I don't know what the right shakes a little bit, right? As you're climbing out um, and you're climbing into the sort of thinner air, right? You often will get that sort of shaky, um, yeah. shaky feeling on, on takeoff. And what's interesting is, you know, once you hit whatever it whatever it is, 10,000 feet or what what have you, I'm sure it depends on weather conditions and all kinds of other things. But what's interesting is you can feel that moment in flight, first of all, where you have that shaking. And then you can feel that moment when the plane levels out. And then when it's almost like, it, to me, it's always felt like it's putting on the brakes a little bit in a car. Like you can feel that moment when it just pulls back, right? And then you're cruising from then on until you're then reconfiguring to land or to do whatever else you need to do. So what's interesting is what I think happens with a lot of vocalists is I think they never throttle back the engines after they take off. I think that what happens is, yeah, we get that runway. We're going down the runway. We're going down the runway. I'm taking in too much air. I'm really in this moment because, you know, belts don't just come out of anywhere. Usually they build up in the music. So we're building up, building up in the music down the runway, taking off. Right. Um, and then, you know, they don't pull back on the throttles once they're up in this place and allowing their voice. And again, it takes training and it takes the instrument acquiescing to it. But instead of continuing to push, 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 they're not allowing the aerodynamic reality to take over and continue to trust that it will support their belt, right? Yes. So a question I have for you is, first of all, how accurate of a description did I just give about the basics of how that, how that, those first stages of flight work? And then secondly, what would happen to a, say, a commercial airplane, you know, a 737, a 747, if they did not throttle back on the engines at cruising altitude? Um, the first part, it's a, it's a fairly reasonable uh, analogy, I would say. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the second part of that, what would happen? Um, essentially... Aircrafts are built around schedule and efficiency, right? You have um, a huge portion of the way to take off is fuel. Mm -hmm. And um, so you want to be able to use that fuel as efficiently as possible and also get to your destination when you're supposed to get there. Um, there there's been some crazy statistics about when things happen you know, to the air system as a total. Everything gets backed up. And there's only so many spots at airports for planes to be. Um, to offload passengers, to, you know, the utilities that they need. Um, so all of these airplanes have to be in the right place at the right time. They, they can't actually be there too early mm -hmm. or else it causes trouble. And so that's one of the things that, that planes do. That's part of the reason why they, they sort of throttle down. You go full power so that you can get up away from the weather systems that are down low, away from all of the traffic that's near grounds, that's near the ground level. Um, and then once you're out of that, you throttle back to get yourself on uh, to, to the speed that you need to be a to get there on schedule and b so that you're at that most efficient place for fuel usage. OK. And so what when you're when you're in this sort of um, takeoff stage that is going down the runway. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And then the moment of sort of breaking the bonds of the earth, as one of my pilot friends often called it. Um, and you're taking off. And you're, what's that? That's kind of dreamy. Very I know, romantic. right? It is. It's good for singing analogy, right? Um, you're going down uh, the runway. What are some things that um, could cause, for example, a pilot to configure the plane and the takeoff in a way that they wouldn't ordinarily, that would not typically be your everyday, you know, run-of-the-mill takeoff? 
Um, some things you, you might do a little differently if there was um, heavy winds, heavy, heavy crosswinds. Um, you might config, configure the plane a little bit differently to, to deal with that, um, to be a little bit more stable as it starts to gain those first bits of lift to break the bonds of the earth, as you said. Um, the, other, the other thing you might, if, depending on the runway length, um, for uh, shorter runways, there's some things you have to do differently so that you can get off the ground a little bit quicker. What would that be? Like, let's say that you have like a really super short, cause you see, you know, on YouTube, you'll see that there are these videos of these extreme airports and things that have these super short runways or that, you know, a pilot can't land at a certain airport under a, under an unplanned circumstance because yep. the runway is too short. What are some of the, you know, technical things, I guess, that a, that a pilot would have to do in order to take a shorter runway? And the reason that I ask this is because, just like I said in, in you know, in a piece of music, the buildup might be kind of like a really long harmonic progression where we're um, feeling the tension for a long time and we want that mm -hmm. tension to resolve and resolve and resolve. That to me would be like similar to the long version of the runway, but sometimes those belts, it is, it kind of smacks you in the face a little bit with a uh, very little sort of quote runway um, as it's building up in the orchestra or whatever else. So how does that happen differently? So for, for short runways, there's a few things that pilots do. They'll actually um, basically run the plane to full, full throttle, holding the brakes. And then they'll re release the brakes so that you get as much of a running start as possible, one thing. The other thing is um, airplanes on the wings have something called flaps. And it's a little extension that hangs off the back of the, the wing. You'll see it when you come in for landing. And what they do is by coming down, they change the shape of the wing to let it get more lift. And so by having those down for takeoff, you get lift faster um, and, and get into the air much more quickly. So... To play devil's advocate for a second, why don't they always do? I mean, you want to have as much runway left as possible, right? Why Why doesn't every takeoff work with, you know, I'm going to have my foot on the brake or whatever. I don't know if you, is your foot on the, the brake in a plane. I don't know. However, yeah. you break the plane. Okay, great. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to put it to like full throttle. Why don't they just do that every time? Why is that only for short runway? Um, I don't actually know. Uh, I do know it, it's a little tricky uh, at times when you when you take off in that configuration um, because you you get off the ground at a much lower speed mm, and because mm -hmm. of that uh, it's not quite as controllable. I see. So yeah, and and you can feel that uh, in in the in the pilot's chair. It feels a little squirrely, a little squishy at first before you get to the full levels that you kind of expect. And so when we're we're cruising. What's happening in a, in a regular cruise? Like if we, I'm sure this is different in every plane and every situation, but what is the, you know, if you, if you throttle down, for example, when you're at cruising altitude, what is the percentage difference of the engine thrust on takeoff, for example, versus the engine's involvement in cruising? That's going to be different for every aircraft. And I wouldn't know for sure. I can tell you, for the small, the small airplanes that I'm um, flying, the you know two and four seat Cessnas and, and Pipers, um, we go from basically a hundred percent throttle to take off. We'll back down to close to around about eighty percent for. Uh, oh, interesting. That's flight. way like less than I thought the percentage difference would be. Yeah, and and again, it's all depends on what you're trying to do. Again, I can push that up to ninety, and we'll go a little bit faster, but maybe it's not quite as efficient. So it all depends on where you want to be. Well, of course, like Cessnas are not jet related, right? Is that correct? Um, yeah, the planes that I'm flying have a, a propeller. Okay, so that I imagine that's also because I was thinking, you know, on those commercial airplanes, you know, you really hear the difference. Like it's a pronounced also it's like screaming yeah, audible difference that. of takeoff to throttle down. So what is happening aerodynamically during that process? Because you know, I always tell people, I think that when they're concerned about a belt, particularly if they've gone through all the gym work, right? We've done the work that is necessary to get the vocal folds more pliable. We've made sure that they're not going to have the urge to push uh, to get the note. We've talked about how to place the sound, meaning where the sound is going to resonate the most in the body 
in order mm-hmm. to get it most efficient. It is a it is a fine balancing act. And because each individual human is built acoustically uniquely, although there are obviously, you know, a lot of things <laughs> that are the same. It's a it's a little bit of a unique thing for each individual, although the underlying principles are similar. So when we are in this state of one of the things that's hardest that I that I um will will say to people is you have to back up and really look like oftentimes like two measures before or eight notes before the actual note, because so often it's in that takeoff phase. It's not the actual note itself that's going to be the most challenging. It's going to be how you take off into that note, right? So if you're going back to the beginning of that, maybe it's the the previous time you took a breath or maybe yep. it's in some musical way. It's, you know, and, and, and going back and looking at how we approached because that approach is really i find the most distinct characteristic of a good belt oftentimes as opposed to the note itself but then there is this moment that most performers have where they'll get a really good takeoff but then they are afraid to kind of throttle down to cruise and let that note go because they're afraid their voice is going to crack because they're afraid that um you know it's it's a scary thing to go from a lot of power to not a lot of power, right? I know, yeah. Um, singing is scary. Yeah. So, well, we know you think singing <laughs> is scary. We know that. He's trying to get out of it. Um, so what is happening aerodynamically in a typical cruising situation on a plane? One of the things that you said earlier basically hit the nail on the head. It's a balancing act, right? Um, and so that's kind of what what's happening once you get to cruise. Um, you set a certain power level, so there's a certain throttle, and that's giving you a level of thrust. And for that level of thrust at the position that the, the plane is at, you have a certain amount of lift, which is keeping you at the same altitude. And, and those are also balanced. The level of thrust that you have um, is going to be balanced by the drag that's created by this aircraft and the wing configurations. Um, and it all adds up when you're in cruise. Um, all of the forces are equal and you're just going the same constant speed at the same constant height. Which is really interesting because in vocal pedagogy and vocal science, we talk so much about equilibrium and balance. Balanced onset, meaning when the sound starts, how do we balance the way that we are starting the sound in a, very, in, in a variety of ways? balanced breath work, equilibrium in the breath and subglottal pressure and all of these things. So, I mean, it's it's interesting because it sounds like the forces that you're going for equilibrium of forces in flight is the same exact thing that we're doing when we are talking about um, finding equilibrium in the voice. And perhaps that baton pass, if you will, um, between one set of forces and one condition of force configuration and the next one that's tricky right it is very yeah and in flight as well talk about that a little bit like talk about you know some of the things that someone has to be aware of if they're flying a plane going from um i have this one set of forces in play as i'm climbing and i have a whole other set of forces that are going to be in play when i'm cruising but there at some point there's like a area that is connecting those two right and for i think that that's very true in the voice there's a there's an area of the voice that in the italian school is called the passaggio and it's it's the break you know we call it the break in the voice and that's where we spend you know 80 percent of our time as vocal technicians is helping someone navigate their break because it's very much like learning to drive a stick shift right um and you know when you start you're like hitting Right. And then you learn to smooth it out. And it's very much what we're doing there. So that's an example for me of a baton pass in the voice. How does that same kind of baton pass work in terms of equilibrium with regard to, say, handing over from cruising to or from um, takeoff to cruising? I mean, essentially what you're doing in the aircraft is is um, you have to dial it to where you want it to be. Right. So I um, I've gone through the flight planning and I know what I want my speed to be in the air um, so that I can, you know, meet specific checkpoints along my route. Beforehand. And beforehand. Yep. So once I get to this altitude that I've chosen, then I, I dial the power and I've basically got to basically dial the power so that I can hit that speed. 
And again, as I have more power, then there's going to be more lift, but I want to keep the same altitude. So I have to change basically the, the, the nose of the plane to keep it at the same altitude. And so it's this fine tune. If I give it a little bit more power here, then I've got to also put the nose down a little bit so that I stay at the same place. And then alternately, if I take some power out, then I've got to, to, to pitch the nose up a little bit to stay at the same altitude. And so that's kind of the, the trick of, of getting um, into that perfect cruise that you want to be. The art, the art of it. Yeah, well, it is the art of it. And I assume that the decisions that are made in planning a, a flight plan ahead of time probably change at the last minute sometimes with regard to variables like weather and all sorts of other things, right? They do indeed, yes. Um, uh, you, you basically have to change your heading sometimes so that the plane, you want it to go west, but you've got to fly slightly north because the wind is going to be pushing you um, in, in the opposite direction. Well, this is a part of that analogy with the voice that I honestly hadn't even thought about, but that is really, I think, um, valuable to consider, which is I always tell people, you know, moments like this, big transitions in songs, particularly when you are transitioning between what we call registers of the voice, for example, across that break and some other registration shifts, um, you know, you have to pre-plan those things. And it's, I call it choreographing the, the change, right? Choreographing how the placement is going to help make this seamless, um, this baton pass, right? Um, because, you know, oftentimes you're not going straight into a, like I said, a belt doesn't often just smack you right in the face out of nowhere. Usually you're coming up to it from another register. And that baton pass is, is sometimes the trickiest part of it. But you have to pre-plan that with a coach. So what vowels am I going to use? How, um, what is my dynamic going to be, uh, meaning loud or soft or in the middle? At a, at, a, at a place. And then also for musical theater, how am I not going to let the emotion of the moment overtake me and make me um, push and thus, you know, over sing and also potentially over time doing that, you know, do damage to my voice. And so I think that that analogy of a flight plan is also so true in terms of the need to choreograph. You wouldn't, you, you wouldn't, um, is it's I mean it's the law to file flight plans right before you before you is that for, accurate for not necessarily but for yes for certain for certain flights yes okay okay but it is it is recommended that you always have a flight plan yes absolutely yeah so that you know where you're going to be so that somebody else knows where you're going to be all of that yeah and the same is exactly the true the same thing I think in terms of how am I going to negotiate these very tricky passages in singing. So let's talk about what happens after so we're cruising. What happens to bring a plane safely back down to landing? Some magic. Some magic. I've always heard that <laughs> that is like I've always heard that the landing is the most like the is the it is, it's, part. No, and when you when you go in to take your first uh your your first plane flight to decide if this is something that you want to do, um, they sit you in the left seat, which is like the main chair. And basically, it's your controls for takeoff. You go full power and you're controlling it on the way up. You pull back to get the plane off the ground. Like you do that on your first lesson before wow. knowing anything at all wow. about airplanes. Um, it takes a while to learn how to land safely. <laughs> but essentially what you do is you get yourself into a steady configuration so that you're descending at a, at a very good rate. And you plan and plan and plan and train and train and train. So that descent always looks exactly the same. Um, for aircraft, you have something what's called your landing traffic pattern. Mm. Um, and you set it up so that you're alongside the runway. Um, and then you go about a mile out and you turn and you go about a mile and you turn and you're basically lined up a mile away from the air airline, uh, from the from the runway. And through all of this time, you've been at this known descent. And you've been watching your speeds and you've been configuring the flaps and, and everything so that you're ready to land. Um, and you do it over and over and over again and, and it becomes second nature. And this is why I would assume in many instances, pilots need to be certified on a particular aircraft or have to have flown a certain number of hours on a particular aircraft. Because as you said, although there are many underlying similarities, obviously, um, between how aircrafts work... Each aircraft, you're going to configure a little differently to some degree when you're doing that, right? 
Absolutely, yes. I mean, some. I mean, the, one of the biggest ones, and and something I think a lot of people have trouble with is uh, landing gear. Mm. Um, for a lot of the planes that you learn on, the landing gear is always down, and then all of a sudden you get into a streamlined version, and you have to remember to make sure that your landing gear is down, or you will be landing on the belly of the plane, and that's not so good. Not recommend. So. Not recommend. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, I think that that's also true with the voice. It's again, it's, you know, as I said, although there are many underlying principles, there are some individual similarities to individual voices. And so, and even styles in which you're singing, you know, so you could, you could sort of talk about to some degree, the style in which a person is singing in the moment, mm -hmm. um, or the genre in which a person is singing as being, yeah, we're singing. That's the same, <laughs> but you know, the amount of time that you spend in that style obviously is going to, um, impact your success in the um, the way that you handle planned situations, certainly, but even more probably, um, you know, um, obviously unplanned situations as well. Yeah, and certainly, and that's one of the biggest things you learn um, flying an aircraft is is how to be ready when things are not what you expect, when things are not normal. Absolutely. Well. I have to say, this was such a pleasure to have you and to speak with you about this because it's something that I have talked a lot about in very general terms. And now I have way more specific ways to uh, talk about incorporating uh, this analogy. And certainly, like you said about the flight plan and, and choreographing um, all the different parameters of a song and of, of difficult passages. And this has been really insightful. And I always love learning new things that are outside of the realm of the voice as well, obviously. And so I've learned a lot about flight and a lot about aeronautics and um, the basics of those things. And now I know what SpaceX does. So look at that. And I've learned a lot about singing and now I am still terrified. Amazing. Well, it turns <laughs> out that Amado and I have to go uh, to a voice lesson right now. So um, is that a surprise to you? Yeah. Y'all wish me luck. Cricket. For every everyone who's listening. Wish Amazing. Me luck. Well, we'll see how it goes. Thank Thanks again much. for being here. And thanks to all of you for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining me on today's episode of Cola Voce. And until next time, remember, follow your heart and follow your voice.